is improvisation? That's a really, really important question, but most of us never answer it. And then we start building a strategy of how to learn to improvise on top of not knowing what it is. And that's what we're going to do something about here. After watching this video, you'll actually know what improvising and composing is on a bits and bytes level. And it's a really short video, so stay tuned. So let's look into it. Improvising is really associating. You know, you do that all the time when you speak, for instance. I do that now because I, I take one sentence and then it reminds me of another thing I need to say. And then I say the next sentence, which then reminds me of the next thing and so on. You do that when you speak to people. When you talk to a friend, he says something which is associating. He's, he's starting in one end and then it's kind of a linking of together of different subjects he's speaking about or just one subject and then a little link about all the different st stuff he wants to mention about that subject. And then you hear that and then you come, you know, you start thinking of something and then you throw that back to him and then you go back and forth like that all the time. You do that when you're thinking. Uh, thinking is nothing but associating. You think of one thing, then that reminds you of another, and then you think about that, and then that, rem and so on. We do that all the time, all day. And improvising is really learning a bunch of skills so you can improvise with notes instead of thoughts or words or whatever it is, right? But when improvising becomes hard, it's often because we have too, too few building blocks and that we don't master these building blocks. So we can't associate fast enough. We can compose maybe, but doing it real time, it's much like doing what I'm doing now, which is talking real time, trying to, trying to tell people something real time. And that really requires you to have mastery over the language that you're, that you're speaking. So you don't have to search and probe every time you need a new concept. It just comes out like that boom, intuitively, right? But so let's look into it. Uh, what is association? Well, you know that already, right? If I say, if you, I'm just going to say a word, okay? I'm saying a word to you, and then you have to say the next word that you associate in your mind right away. And don't think about it. Just say whatever comes on the top of your mind. As soon as I say my word, you just answer. So I say the word strawberry. Then you mention something else. You might say melon, or you might say lemon. But whatever is closest to the concept of strawberry, it might be another fruit, right? But it also might be your grandmother, because when you were a child, that's what you remember about strawberries, that you were eating strawberries with cream or whatever at your grandmother grandmother's place. So, you know, so your brain is basically made up of these associations. And if you imagine a whole, a whole range of, you know, hexagons, that's it, uh, in, a, in a whole, uh, like a matrix almost. And then you have, I'll just bring that up on the screen right now. And then you have the strawberry in the middle. And then your brain, that's memory basically, your brain has close, close things associated to that concept of strawberries. And you can see those around in the little model I've put up on the screen now. You can see the melon there, which might be the closest association you have to strawberries. And it also might be your grandmother, or lemon, or another concept completely. So if you envision your brain as that enormous uh, system of associations that are close to each concept and far away, because this, all, even though you can see in the model that there's a lot of empty uh, hexagons there, all those hexagons have other concepts within them. Now imagine then that you're improvising and within those hexagons, you have licks. So one lick is reminding you of something else, right? This is one lick. And that lick reminds you of say, right? So each lick you have can potentially remind you of other licks if that is your basic structure with which you've built the ability to improvise. What then happens sometimes is that when I say strawberry to you, you say lemon. And then lemons remind you of your grandmother because you used to have a lemon tree in, in the garden. First you say strawberry, then you say lemon, then you say grandmother, but grandmother reminds you of strawberries as well. So, because you had that, you know, when you were a kid. And so you go back to strawberry, which reminds you of lemons, which reminds you of your grandmother. So now you have this kind of insane little circle and that's where you run out of licks. We feel stuck there. We might know a thousand licks, but those are the only two we go back or three or four or five that we go back and forth between. So what do you do about that? Well, 
my whole point here, uh, and and what I what I luckily uh, realized uh, uh, some years ago was that when you start practicing s- uh, sequences instead of licks, then what you basically have in your little hexagons are just these cold mathematical processes that you 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 don't play a lick here, which is about you know eight notes or six notes, and then you play another big block of six notes or eight notes over here. No, you have a little sequence like whatever, but you only play two notes of that, for instance, or let's just make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to understand. That's all you play. That's one hexagon. And that reminds you of sliding up. You hear that in your mind. So that becomes a little lick that you create instantly. Or oh, you say, you might have, uh, let's say, th- that kind of sequence, right? So you go, uh, let me see if I can remember the first thing. Uh. So that's what you play. But but then again, this is two big blocks, actually, because what happens when you improvise with sequences is that you, for instance, play... Right, that's all you do because, and then you have so little piece. The pieces here are so small that you go from hexagon to hexagon. Like instead of having do, go lick here, lick there, change the lick a little bit, go back to that and change that. Then you have you have two notes from this hexagon, one note from that even, then two notes, three notes, four notes, and then the whole the whole process of improvising becomes like. You just explode out into all of these little hexagons going from field to field rapidly, combining and creating licks, creating lines from that. So instead of having line here, line there, line there, you create one line by going da 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 through five hexagons, for instance, and that's what you hear as licks when I play, for instance. Where did that come from? That came from from that, for instance. You know, it's little bits and pieces. Just to take a let me just explain more thoroughly. Let's let's take a, a sequence like. A little thing like that, which is enormously melodic, right? And just by playing just a little bit of that sequence, it instantly creates an association in your mind for an ending. So you go... And that little... is from a sequence that goes like this. So I play... See, another thing again there, I, uh, I have a hard time playing the same thing twice because everything is a creational process. And I'm not saying that to seem significant, right, or seem like this is the... But it is a lot more fun, sorry to say it, but it is a lot more fun because you're creating all the time instead of reproducing specific lines that you pre-learned. So, um, that was it, I think, yeah. So you create a little melody. And that that reminds you of that was a right. So it becomes really a totally different process than using licks which is basically bits and pieces. So once we, now we know what improvisation is. It's jumping from hexagon to hexagon. So now you know how to learn to improvise is to make sure that you have these hexagons all in place. But we also know how to practice this in a limited way is by taking, let's say you have that center. That's just to say that you have a, a classical sequence like... Right, and that's your center. That's what's in the middle there. Then let's uh, do another sequence and put that in another hexagon, just right next to it, and practice being able to associate from to 
right? So we practice that shift from one to, to the other, and then we, we're going to create the whole flower there of one in the middle and then all the hexagons, but let's just um, say... That's one exercise of combining them. Or I could go... Right? So I start practicing combining them, and now I have two things I can associate back and forth between. Right? And then I can, I can practice ending these little sequences, combining just these two, and then practice ending them. And then using my barbado sliding, whatever it is, and this is a playful little process of... Right? And so I do that. Then I do another sequence. I do, for instance, let's say, uh, what can we... Let's say that. You have a pedal note in a, in a six-note shape, and then you just... Right? Or you could do the opposite. Right? But let's just stay with this. So let's just practice... Right, so now I can I can go both ways. I can go. <laughs> you hear that cool little thing there? And 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 of course in the beginning you play you know a little bit of uh, of the sequence, uh, you know a couple of notes so you can really hear it so your brain knows what it's doing. But then as you become more and more uh, skilled in this, you can go. You know, you, you put them, you associate faster and faster. So you just play two notes from that, one note, two notes from that. And then you, you create the whole flower there. And that is a power lick. That is the power lick philosophy, which I came up with in an attempt to, to design a way to learn this specifically step by step, right? So you take generic sequences that fit together and then you put them in that little flower there so you have a little bunch of stuff that you can go back and forth in between and then you become better and better at it you first practice the individual sequences then you practice combining them and then you practice ending beginning putting cool endings to them and that's the whole process then what you've done that you do another power lick you do another power lick you do another flower so to speak and then what gradually happens is that you develop the ability to just play and then there's no no absolutely no running out of licks ever because that whole concept is just hilarious it's, it has nothing to do with what you're doing you're not running out of little pieces to play because you can combine these little bits and pieces endlessly